are. Da, na, 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 na. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Film Trooper Presents Film Marketing Fridays. This is the logo, and this is my big fat face as it pops up. Happy Friday. <laughs> I am joined today by, why don't you introduce yourself, David, and you, how do you pronounce your last name? Sure. Hi, uh, I'm David Andrade, so you can say that like the words on, draw, day, get it? Andrade, and uh, I run Theory Animation. It's an online animation studio. Very cool. We're going to definitely get uh, more into that in all the cool stuff that you're making. And I really like the last the trailer that you just made for the festival, so we'll get into that more. But I have some house cleaning i got to do. Um, <laughs> last session, um, I was it was great because um, Chris Reed, who follows me on Twitter, and I follow him, uh, he called me out on saying, hey, you kind of miss interpreted or misrepresented, I uh, had a small bit of information I was sharing on uh, last uh, film, marketing, film Marketing Fridays, which I was trying to explain how uh, this lawsuit that came up uh, with Warner Brothers and this author who had written a book who had sold the property to New Line, actually uh, Katza Productions, who was uh, parents who, whose parent company was New Line Productions, and is essentially called Gravity. Let me show you this real quick. So I... My bad was like last week I kind of uh, misinterpreted the article or what the what the whole law lawsuit was, and I'm gonna share screen share that right now so people can see what the hell I'm talking about. All right, so to get it correctly to get to explain exactly what happened, so you see that David? Mm -hmm. Okay. So internationally best-selling author and scientist and doctor, I think. Well, I'll probably get that wrong too now. I think she's just a doctor. <laughs> so, uh, Tess Gerritsen. Did I pronounce that right? Gerritsen? That sounds pretty close enough. So, essentially, what happened was she wrote a novel called Gravity. No kidding. It's crazy. Right here. She, sold, um, she wrote this book uh, called Gravity. Right there's the cover. In 1999, she sold the feature film rights to. Uh, uh, Katza Motion Picture uh, Corporation, which was the parent company, or its parent company was New Line Productions. Essentially what happened was the, uh, the development of her film ended in 2002. Like she didn't hear anything. And a lot of things had happened too because Warner Brothers came in and acquired New Line Productions and basically fired everybody. And it's like so New Line was out. I think around the um, during when the economy was imploding around 2006 2007 you know that that time time that time period well what happened was you know Tess didn't hear anything about anything that, about this movie that she had worked on and and pretty much had included everything uh, that you see in the movie she talked about first of all the name of the book is gravity it involves a doctor out in space um, and she added all these elements into it and during the contract which is including scenes of satellite debris colliding with an international space station and then total destruction of the international space station and a surviving female astronaut left adrift in her spacesuit alone and untethered I mean that's pretty spot on so when they made the film uh, Afonso Cuaron made the film in 2000 you know uh, I think it was when was it was released it was, um, a few years ago, but they started like in 2008. So even um, Tess here describes that it was in a realm of possibility that this was a coincidence. But then she learned, this is totally unbeknownst to her, she had no idea that back in um, 2000, uh, the year 2000, Alfonso Cuaron was actually attached to direct gravity. So he would have seen the that this book was attached to, you know, the whole development of this project. So that really spurred her um, lawsuit against Warner Brothers saying, hey, you, you know, I had this contract. It's, I wrote this book and, you know, I'm, I'm not receiving any sort of monetary uh, involvement or, you know, benefits from the success of the film. Um, and what was the big thing about this for other authors is why this is important for every writer who sells to Hollywood should be alarmed by this is that currently the judge has thrown out this law lawsuit, but they're not giving up. Uh, Tess's uh, uh, attorneys are are restructuring the um, the claim against Warner Brothers uh, in New Line. But really, what happened was that you know, if you read this article, I'll make sure I, I put it in the 
the, the link notes and so on like that. But essentially what happened was Warner Brothers was not honoring anything that they acquired through the takeover, which, which they should. Mm -hmm. you know. And that's, that's what becomes alarming to anyone working in that um, as a writer who sold anything to you know, New Line or what, say any other company that gets acquired. And that's why it's very difficult when you sell any sort of intellectual property over to another entity and especially if you have like a, a long-term uh, contract where it's like, you know, we, that company says, you know what, you know, David, I want to buy all uh, your characters um, yeah. and that you're working on and, we're, and it's awesome. Here's the rights. So you get like a, a small minimum guarantee, maybe $5,000, but we have the rights now. We're going to develop it through our partnership with like Warner Brothers or, or say there's a subsidiary of Warner Brothers, like, a, mm -hmm. like another version of New Line. And all of a sudden, you know, a lot of stuff, you're just in development hell, basically. Like, you, nothing ever happens. Like, you're always waiting for something to happen, and, like, maybe five, ten years go by, and nothing happens. And then a few years later, they release a project that has, like, your characters are very similar to everything that you've created, and you get no compensation for it. And what you learn is that the, the company that you sold the intellectual property rights to had basically been taken over by a gigantic entity like Warner Brothers, mm -hmm. but Warner Brothers is not honoring any contract that used to be under that old company. So that's why, it's, if I understand the article correctly, and I'm sure Chris uh, Elliott was, was well, that's terrible. Chris Reed, I just said Chris Elliott. Chris, I gotta have Chris on. He just actually yeah. um, pinged me on um, Twitter. <laughs> so I'm going to DM him and say, you know, yeah, you got to get him on, on the show because he's actually a digital marketer himself. But anyway, he pointed out the, um, the, correct, the corrections that I, I needed to make on that uh, article that I sort of misrepresented um, in the last episode. So thanks for letting me do some um, uh, housekeeping there. And, uh, and now we can get on to you. <laughs> I kind of want to stick on that for just a moment. Oh, yeah? What? Have there been any other lawsuits similar to this? Mm -hmm. uh, it's similar to this kind of concept. Wasn't there the Last Samurai one, for example? Didn't that? Yeah, there. you know what? There's, um, there's kind of a weird saying, like, in Hollywood. Sometimes um, a lot of them just don't want to tr They try not to, you know, be sued. But it happens, um, and sometimes they're just kind of, um, you know, dicks about it, where they're like, well, doesn't sue us. You know what I mean? It's like, or yeah. like, the producer, there's a lot of famous lawsuits. Uh, the most, one of the most famous ones was like, uh, Coming to America, this Eddie Murphy comedy back in the 80s. I heard um, about that one. Yeah, Art Buck, I think it's Art Buckwall, had created a story uh, for whatever studio that was, um, and it was, a, you know, a long lawsuit, but he won because it was, uh, you know, um, copywriting infringement or basically too much of the same story that they had taken to correct, uh, create this movie and uh, not given you know, the, the due credit and due comp, uh, monetary compensation to the person who had created it or come up with the story or, you know, and just understand and they call it like the chain of title knowing like if you wrote something, you created something, you register that with, with like the uh, United States uh, Copyright you know, Office and then if it gets sold, you know, you gotta have to like how many iterations of that. That's why the Writers Guild is there to protect, you know, and, and they, they there's Harbor, Harbor oh man, my English is bad, but there's a, basically there's like a hearing, like if there's any um, dispute, like the guild comes in and protects writers on all sides, the, you know, to make sure that the producers aren't taking advantage of the writers, or if there's se several writers involved, then they have to do the process of determining. You know how much has a script changed, and who really does deserve credit and compensation? So this stuff happens all the time, especially if you have like iterations upon iterations of yeah. of, of story um, structure or something like that. And you don't know, like one company had the rights, and then they got bought up or went bankrupt, and then another company bought buys it. You know, it, it can get really really messy. And um, I know f um, friends who've had films that are been made, and they can't track down who actually owns the rights to this film that's like, you know, 30 plus years old that they're still trying to get rights to so they can, whoever owns the rights, so, so they can you get the, the, you know, so they can get the DVDs themselves or something. So it can get messy. I think, um, God, what other ones have there been? Uh, I'm sure somebody else could, uh, you know, chime in from, from 
what a list of like famous uh, lawsuits, but yeah, so it it happens, but it's something you know not not everybody needs to be like I think super afraid of, but they need to know sort of you know realistically like. Um, what can happen? I mean, this is a this is pretty crazy because that's she has a pretty. I don't know why the judge would throw it out. It may depend on based based on the technicalities of how the the lawsuit is presented. Mm -hmm. Again, I haven't done my due diligence in doing enough of the reading. Like she actually provides a link to the actual claim, so um, they have like 30 days of lawyers to rewrite the um, the lawsuit claim. So just it might just be rewording. So they might have to take all this other information that has come up. And then reword it, like lawyer speak, right? You know, <laughs> they just need to do that, and then resubmit the the, the claim against Warner Brothers. But uh, it's a, I don't know, it it looks too. This one is like to me, from the outside perspective, how she's presented it. It looks pretty straightforward. Like, you know, you wrote a book, you sold it to a company that was eventually bought up by uh, Warner Brothers. They made a successful movie from it. The director was actually attached to the same project. Where your book was involved during the time period, so it's like there's way too many things uh, that, that I can't. I, if she doesn't get in her favor, it'd be really interesting to see why. Yeah, 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 yeah. I guess that that uh, that scares all creators. You should all stay home and do nothing. Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, um, I had a let's say a similar story, not even close like that. But that's in my book. You'll read it later. <laughs> so. <laughs> But let's, it's about you now. Um, let's why don't you share with us about everything about theory animation? I'm going to jump to your website so people can uh, see your homepage at least, and um, and kind of give us uh, you know a rundown of what theory animation is and what characters uh, that you are creating. So here sure. we go to the screen share. You should be able to do this, um, and you sort of do you see that now? Excellent. Oh, it works too. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> Once, uh, I'm going to do my best to sort of navigate, but go ahead and tell, uh, explain to the audience everything that you're doing at Theory Animation. Sure. So this is our animated entertainment website. Uh, if if you have kids or you are a kid or you're a kid at heart, this is an excellent place for you to go. Uh, we're inspired by cartoons like Ren and Stimpy, Rocco's Modern Life. We just want to make animated entertainment that isn't all about boobs and explosions uh, for the masses. I'll okay, I'm turning. I'm turning it off. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Pitched over. That's a, no. So basically, it's great. So family friendly entertainment. Right. A family friendly, easy place to come to. And as soon as you lo load the page, you're like, okay, it's moving, and you you might be a little frightened. So uh, mouse over a button. Don't actually click it, but mouse over one of those words over there. And so now the characters kind of play around with you depending on which option you're going to pick. And this is just the beginning. We're, we're really diving deep and exploring this interactivity between you and uh, you and the characters. But then as soon as you load it up, it's kind of like a nice little, you, you go into their world. You're in their place now. Um, Why don't you tell who, who these characters are? The, the, the green iguana is... Ray. That Ray. is Ray. Yep. And uh, Clovis the cat. Now... Ray is this really laid back, cool guitar playing dude. He just he's jazzy, he's chill, you know, he's like all iguanas. He doesn't do much. He just sits around, you know, and he works at a radio station. He wants to be a musician one day and he he dreams of being this big time rock star. Now Clovis, uh, that's the cat that's right in front of us. Clovis the kitty, uh, he is complete opposite. And he is the crazy one. He is he's like Chris Pratt's character from uh, <laughs> Parks and Rec. Okay. He's yeah. he's all excited and happy. He's super low maturity. Um, <laughs> but he's highly cultured and he loves horror movies and he loves video games. And he want he dreams about being a superhero. So each uh, each episode we kind of dive into a little bit more of their characters or learn a little bit more about them. Uh, and in fact, if you click on watch over there on the top left, can we click it? Yeah, go ahead. go for it. You. you probably hear him in the background. He's about this. <laughs> okay. okay. Wait, so let me ask screen... you. Do you hear any of that? Uh... I, I don't. But okay, I, I hear. It. I'm not yeah. just sure if the audience hears it, but that's okay. But it, it, that was really funny. <laughs> what are you? Yeah. Anyway, go ahead. Sure. So you go to Rain Clovis. That's the first. Uh, that's the first show. 
that we make. And uh, and we'll get to learn, and we'll talk all about that, too. Uh, you can click on any of those. They all go to the same place. Okay. So up a little. And this is Rain Clovis. Now, these are all the shorts. Uh, you, you can watch them one at a time. You can watch them all in unison. And we just released this vlog. I don't even... How do you say it? Do you say vlog? Blog? I say vlog. Vlog. I, I, right. You know, it's just easier because people say blog. I say vlog, but vlog, yeah. We, we make fun of the internet once in a while, and so that <laughs> we're making fun of them with this first vlog that we've made. But there's nine short films, and you can go ahead and watch any of them if you want. But the, the vlog is the first one. I'm sorry, the newest one that just came out today. Uh, and you can click on it. You'll, users can kind of see what's going to happen here. It's... Uh, a YouTube short. You can go ahead and watch it. It's like 90 seconds. And, and what happens in this episode is that Clovis has won a camcorder and Ray just wants to chill out and play his guitar. But Clovis wants to film his first vlog and, you know, unfortunately Ray has to uh, suffer Clovis's crazy camcording experience. Cool. I have no idea if this is actually playing smoothly on the Hangout world, so I'm going to let the ad run so you can get paid. There you go. Yes. <laughs> All right. Now I'm going to go to Subway and buy myself a sandwich. That would be terrible. Um, the, uh, yeah, so a little bit about, like, the characters. Uh, Ray, Clovis, the, they were... Evan, who writes the show, can, can tell you more about this. And he's going to be really upset when I mess this when I mess this part up. Um, but <laughs> Clovis references uh, he's a Maine Coon, and he references uh, Stephen King novels. Uh, apparently, there's like a, a horror story or book or something in Clovis. And I know Evan's going to get so angry when I mess it all up. But and then Ray, Ray is just a chill iguana, uh, and we 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 kind of compare them a lot to Ren and Stimpy. Mm -hmm. um, Rocco's Modern Life, or my favorite, you know, two-character comedy, Odd Couple. Uh, oh, okay. You know, straight man versus the crazy one, you know. Yeah, yeah. The kind of out of out of the place guy. Um, and in the other side to it too is it's it's also really unique how we do all of this stuff. Uh, we do all of it over the web, so there's no like one studio house that everybody sits at. There's no like giant render farm or anything like that. It's all done, actually, remotely. Um, everybody works remotely. So if you go to About, that might might have some uh, stuff up in there. Yeah, so go to About and then Our Story. And what I'm trying to say is, is that we started this studio, me and a group, group of crazy people, um, because we worked at Rhythm and Hughes, we were working in Previs, we were working at Future Film Studios, and we we're like, you know, every time we had to move job to job. It's it's like the circus in the feature film world. You go from job to job. Yeah, you're a carny, basically. <laughs> basically. <laughs> yeah, right. And so we thought, you know, there has to be a better way. And and that better way we thought was we're going to build a studio where anyone can work from anywhere in the world. Uh, and we, if you're scrolling down the list, you see the team. We found some crazy people that were colleagues, that were friends, or co-workers, friends of co-workers, and we assembled this team just to work on shorts and, and see, like, look, we're going to give you the ability to refine your skills. Uh, we're going to teach you some great animation, and we're going to make a fun little cartoon in the whole process. And a lot of people really responded to the ability to work on an animated short or an animated film anywhere from any place in the world. Uh, and that's actually the people that you're looking at right now. We, we cover a couple countries now. We have artists that are in Australia. We have artists that are in the Canada and the U.S. We have a couple that are in South America between Chile and Argentina. And Germany and the U.K. are our European arm. Uh, of artists. And again, these people, like, they come in and out. Some of them would like to do a shot. Some of them, they want to learn a little bit about animation or Blender. And some of them are between gigs, and we have an extra shot or short to give them. So we've been able to build this way for people to work remotely uh, over the Internet. And we call it theory animation. But that's not where it ends. It's not where it ends. There's one more step to this. I'm going to force you to go to one more tab. Sure. Um, go to maketheory.com. Oh, maketheory.com? Yeah. Just how it sounds. No, you know, fancy web 2.0, T-H-E-E-E-R or anything. Yeah, yeah. Maketheory.com. So we built this technology, right? And initially it was just to make shorts and to learn how to make animated shorts and work together. And it was just 
testing, like could we do it? Uh, and, and we did, we made a couple of shorts. And now, just last month, we announced Make Theory, which is our tool set for any creative out there, whether you're making a game, a virtual reality experience, an animated short, uh, anything, you can use the tools that we use to work together remotely. And it includes a whole bunch of really fun things to manage your project, to do drawovers and critique in real time. And we've partnered with a couple of cool companies also to do like always on video rooms so that you can talk to people instantaneously at the click of a button. No having to call them, seeing if they're online on Skype or any of that stuff. It all just works. So that is, uh, that's, that's my pitch. That's my, my, my spam for you. Um, but that's Make Theory, and that's the technology that is empowering creatives anywhere who want to work together. And this tool set, you guys, this software, this basically program that you guys have created, uh -huh. is, it, it's, is it free? There is a free version if you're making a short film, a non-commercial project. There's a free version. We give you the task and the ability to work together. Uh, if you're working on a commercial project, depending on how big it is or what the budget is, there's a small fee associated with it. Mostly nice. because server space and render time and all that takes time and money, so we want to cover our cost and, and make sure that it's affordable for you and for us. This so, yeah. is amazing. So amazing. Yeah, it's fantastic, actually. Well, congratulations on all this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and anyone can sign up for an easy demo. There's no nothing crazy about it. Just just turn it on and use it. See if, see if it's something for you. Cool. Uh, I will um I will make sure that um all the links are you know posted for people to get to, for sure. So awesome. Um, now I mean that is really impressive what you guys have done. And I said in something else you you did uh, you were involved with the the documentary on Rhythm and Hughes. Uh, was, it was yes. going, in, the, in that film was kind of highlighting the um, the crazy bankruptcy um, yes. prior, you know, right after it won, like, Oscar uh, for visual effects for, like, Life of Pi, and then it went, you know, out of business or something, <laughs> or it went bankrupt, you know, or had to file for bankruptcy. But well, that was I, a really I, good um, documentary. Talk more about that one real quick. Yeah, I, I didn't mean... I was a little laggy, so I didn't mean to interrupt. Um, so... I worked at Rhythm and Hughes, and if people don't know, Rhythm and Hughes is, is was an amazing studio. It still is. It's still around. An amazing studio based out of uh, Los Angeles. It worked on some fantastic films: Golden Compass, Snow White, Life of Pi. It won an Oscar for Golden Compass and Life of Pi. Um, worked on the first Narnia film. It, it all the Chipmunks movies, I believe. I think there's one they didn't do. Yogi <laughs> Bear. Um, so they, they did some amazing movies, they did some incredibly high quality work, and unfortunately the business changed from under them. And, and that's not to say that they weren't aware that the business was changing, um, but let me kind of illustrate it this way for everybody watching. When's the last time you've been in a movie theater back to back? Like, okay, maybe you saw a movie last week, great, but when's the last time you did that back to back? Like, I saw a movie on Friday and I saw a movie on the weekend, or I saw a movie on one Friday and the next Friday I saw another one, or within the week, you know, like within seven days, when's the last time you've been able to see two movies in the theater? And, and that answer, unfortunately, is usually very little, like, uh, if one, if any. And that's what happened. The, the business changed, and, but the whole business of feature films is built around theatrical release uh, because that's where most of the money came from. So why, why does the theatrical release affect a studio like Rhythm? Um, you know, Life of Pi did $700 million. Why did Rhythm not, you know, that's a lot of money and they won an Oscar for it. What, what happened? Well, the short of it is, is because it, movies are so risky to make, a lot of the work has been farmed overseas where there's either really good incentives or cheap labor. But the other side of it is, is um, there's a lot of equity that's not cut out for anybody, on, on, only like the small, small minority of people who work on it. Um, no one's going to give you a, you know, a royalty or an equity to work on Life of Pi, even though you're going to do all the heavy lifting. They, because honestly, if they reap any reward, they, want, they don't want to give any of that to anybody. Just who they have to contractually give it to you. you know? and, and if a studio says, oh, yeah, we'll do all the work and you don't have to pay us any kind of royalty or anything like that, they'll go with that one over anybody else, right? <laughs> they're going to do it cheaper. 
Uh, and that's what happened. And and that's not it, this is not Rhythm's fault. It's nobody's fault, really. That's just kind of how the business was. So a lot of really great artists worked on these films, and a lot of that work was being sent overseas, where the really good incentives or cheaper labor. And Rhythm was a studio of really expensive Los Angeles artists, but we could get the work done. Uh, and this doesn't cover the, all the other crazy things that happen, like not paying for changes, um, going over on work orders, on, on the studio side of things. But, you know, what happened at the end of it, and it's all documented in this amazing documentary called Life After Pi. Um, it's directed by Scott Lebrecht and, and Christina Storm. Really great documentary. And basically it's a combination of factors that all changed and the fact that many people don't really go to movies anymore so there's not a lot of money in the pot so that forces a lot of other people to really really manage their risk right and and at the end of the day we get um, we get all these people who are trying to fight for the tiniest dollar and and unfortunately rhythm was at the bottom of that pile and so that studio went it's still around it's not dead it was bought out by a wonderful Ooh, you just went black. Are oh we no, no, that's good. Oh, okay. A, I'm just showing up. Uh, yeah, I'm showing. Yeah. Do you see it now? Yeah. I just um, want to show people where it's. Uh, it's on Vimeo. Uh, it's a half-hour documentary, Life After uh, Pie. Wonderful. Yeah. Mommy, why do we have to move to Vancouver? <laughs> <laughs> Hollywood without visual effects? Question mark. There's a and that and we and there was some, uh, you those who supported what you what was going on for the longest time when the little icon or their avatar would have a simple green square mm -hmm. to represent um, the idea that the green screen, like without any work on it, that's all you would get. Like all your, every film that you watch in the theater would have, you know, a large percentage percentage of it, you know, with green screen if you don't have visual for art, uh, effects artists working on it, so. Right, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. That's what happened, you know, and it's sad. A lot of people have found work since then, not, but also a fair amount have not, and also a good amount have moved on completely. Um, the, the the film industry on the major tentpole side has bit had has had a bit of a, a wake up call with this, and another studio that went bankrupt, Digital Domain, um, a, a, another really really big studio, and these are just you know big signs of like the changing world of visual effects but then you know something magical happens which is you know virtual reality starts to take off and started hiring a couple of artists and game development was really taking off and hired a couple, a good amount of artists so the world of filmmaking kind of evolved from rhythm and, and a lot of really smart people you know found really good jobs and everybody is you know still trying to figure it out uh, how, how to make it work uh, but the documentary is excellent and it'll it'll show you kind of how that whole world works and uh, yeah everyone should watch it I think yeah it was really yeah hit home because you know I, I had worked at uh, Sony PlayStation for 12 years and, and ran the uh, um, they call it the pre-rendered uh, cinematic uh, department so we made a lot of the you know worked with probably the same artists that were just traveling around from one contract mm -hmm. to another um, uh, very much in the same vein, so you know, uh, I can relate very, <laughs> very dearly to what your situation and everybody else's situ situation there, as well. But we are here on Film Marketing Fridays, and we are going to try to tackle some of the questions that you sent me earlier mm -hmm. in regard to theory animation and Ray and Clovis. Um, so if you're ready to dive in, we want to just uh, go for it. Let's do it. Okay, so we'll go to the screen share again. So people have uh, something else to look at besides my fat head. <laughs> so here we go. So you see that. So one of your first questions that you sent me was pretty uh, straightforward. How does your film get discovered? Or how does anybody get discovered, right? Mm -hmm. So um, how does anyone get discovered? So one, there's luck, <laughs> which is not the best. You don't want to bank on that. Two, you can put yourself in the right place. And what does that mean? We'll get into that later. Uh, you could have the press talk about you, you know, the me the media, the press, every it means everything, you know, uh, yeah. bloggers, uh, television, whatever it is, like anything that d deals with um, somebody sharing information. Um, even this is like some sort of variation of the press because we're sharing information about Ray and Clovis and theory animation. Um, and then you have I influencers talk about you, you know, and some influencers are, an influencer is basically anybody who has 
a platform that they share information to others, and it can be a very small audience, it can be a very large audience. But um, that's kind of really the basic of the basis of like, well, how do you get discovered? Now, since this is marketing or the discussion of marketing, I guess really the big question is, well, what the hell is marketing? Mm. And one one way to really think about it is, it's just communicating to get a result. Okay, so we're just needing a, a a process, a method to communicate to do what? To get a result. And the question is, well, that's where you got to dig deeper. So, okay, what results do you want to get? Do you want to be discovered in order to get more subscribers? So then that's what you're trying to do. Then then your marketing message, your method of communicating has to be designed to target in on this result. The one result is to get more subscribers. Or do you want to be discovered to get picked up by a larger company? You know, if that's the goal, then there's a whole other strategy about how to go about uh, communicating that to the right people, the right influencers, the right company. Um, and the last thing might be like, you know, do you want to be discovered to sell something? So like the marketing message to sell a product online is something very different than a marketing message where you need to get the interest of a larger company to buy you up. So it's important to understand moving forward what your results, what results do you want? And so, um, you know, something to keep in mind because what you really want to do is like be focused on those results. And there might be a bunch of different results that you want. So as long as you can maybe write it down, mm -hmm. like, okay, you know, with your team and say, okay, the results, we all agree that our number one result is this. We want to get bought up by Cartoon Network or whatever, Disney or something like that. If that's the case, then all of our marketing message has to be strategically designed to get that result. Or, you know, that's that way you're focused. And that way you're not just hoping on luck, you know. Um, one of the other things you, t you had asked was, well, how do you cold call bloggers? Because the, the concept here is that all right, if I want to get discovered by bloggers, I want to get discovered by the press, if I want to just get this, if, you know, we need to get Theory Animation to be, go bigger or Ray and Clovis to go bigger. Well, how do you do this? How do you cold call um, bloggers? Um, if that's the goal, again, if that's the result you want, the result is connecting with bloggers. Um, one, this, this is, again, for everybody, this is sort of just overall just a general strategy. I mean, there's so many different specific tactics that you can use. Um, but this is just sort of a general strategy moving forward. One, you can spend several weeks adding extra value, value to their blogs, whoever's blogging. So mm -hmm. you actually had a question, too, of like, well, how do you find these bloggers? Let's just start with the people that you follow. Like maybe if you're a fan of like a, a bunch of animation blogs or you're, it's like indie, like indie film or like, you know, other filmmaking blogs that you just that you yourself enjoy. Start with that. Just start with the ones that you actually spend time on. Don't worry about like looking for other ones just yet. Start with the ones you like first and see like um, a lot of these bigger blogs um, have like individual uh, writers, the contributors. So you just have to know who the author is. And if you like that particular author's um, work, what you want to do is spend several weeks adding the extra value to that person's articles. And meaning what you do is you contribute it to the comment section. So if they write something, they're hoping somebody reads it. So if you're that person that's always first to comment or, or add a comment uh, in the comment section of an article they've written, or say it's like a, um, we can move forward here. Essentially what you're trying to do is you're trying to be service to them. Like you're, you're trying to be a great fan. You know, you're trying to, you're, you're going to get noticed because you are uh, always there for every article they write, you know. And all these people, they, they want fans, but they, but they want, you know, intelligent uh, people that follow them, that help them out, that basically champion their articles uh, or whatever they share. Um, so, like, for instance, they might be a blogger, but they might be really, really active on Twitter and Facebook or Google Plus or whatever, Instagram, Tumblr. Then, then you can uh, um, expand the conversation on those platforms. So you might have, like, um, they might be sharing a bunch of stuff on Twitter and then you can talk to them on Twitter or just comment like, oh, I really like that article you wrote. I really, okay, specific, yeah. you know, like, like specifically, I really liked what you're, you know, how you broke down, uh, you know, the animation principles or whatever it might be. 
you know, and so they're, oh, thank you so much, and like, uh, and then you could add something to it, like, have you, um, you know, what, like, your work inspire or reminds me of something that somebody else does. Are you familiar with that? And they keep, basically you're just trying to have a conversation. Just imagine you're at a party. You're just trying to, you're just trying to get that party atmosphere going, but on a social media front. But what you're doing is you're not doing anything. You're not letting them know that your theory animation, you know, you're Ray and Clovis yet, or whatever it might be. You're just there being a fan, and you're adding service to them. Uh, and um, and the best thing is like so yeah. So the cool thing is some of these bloggers accept guest blogs, you know, where they need content. If they have a large audience, that means that you know they need help. Um, getting as much content to their, that big audience as much as possible. So if somebody's already built like an audience, a, l a fairly large following, and they have on their website someplace, uh, or if they don't, you can contact them through Twitter or, their, or email them directly because they might probably have a contact page on their blog, is to see if they accept guest blogs. Hmm. Um, and maybe you want to wait because what it is is like after they know who you are, that you're always commenting in their in their their article sections or on Twitter or on Facebook and if they you know you've actually had you know back and forth conversations about just different topics with them then you can approach and say hey do you do accept guest blogs and that way it's not like out of nowhere like they don't know who you are like oh wait uh, yeah sometimes I accept guest blogs but not really but if they if they like you and they they know that you've been involved in sharing their articles or commenting on their articles or coming to their defense sometimes you might have somebody, you know, trolling in their article section, and then you could be somebody who comes to a um, logical defense or and champion what they are talked about or clarification. Anyhow, so the whole point is like you're not a stranger to them, and so when you ask to write a guest blog, they'll probably be more likely to say, "Yeah, you, thank you so much for everything you do in the comment sections." But yeah, of course, what are you doing? What you know, you know, how can you, what guest blogs can you write? Or you propose a guest blog, like, hey, I'm a fan of what you do on, um, on your articles. Um, mm -hmm. Would, you know, I think this topic, if you write like a little blurb or something, or you write, make a video or something and say, this might be really beneficial to your audience. Is this cool? You know, like, can you do this? And they most likely will be like, yeah, you know, that's kind of how it works. So then you get in front of a larger audience that you hadn't built yet. But you're but you've done your job of befriending and being of service to this particular blogger or influencer, and now you have an opportunity to you know ask if you can write a guest blog for their uh, their platform. Again, it's just like a part. Yeah. So again, it's like a party. You don't want to be right up front like, hey, you know, I heard you work at a studio. He goes, look at my film. That's like the you know, <laughs> you know what I mean. It's like it's just imagine you're at a party like somebody had some sort of influence to like some agent or you know Disney Studio or something like that and somebody's just coming in like a spammer like hey check my stuff out check I heard this is what you do they don't know who you are you know there's they're gonna be defensive even on the social media front and even if you email them uh, something really nice um, yeah. it's, it's not gonna be the same effect if you hadn't broken down the eye uh, you know bro yeah, what it we call it What's that? Breaking the ice with them yeah. in terms of uh, knowing who you are. So the, they've seen you over time, several weeks of you adding value to their blog and their comments and their Twitter feed or whatever it might be. They're going to be more likely to be like, okay, let's talk. So um, yeah, so when you see an opportunity to share your project, then you share your project. Or if you can organically share what you're doing. Like for instance, the greatest thing you got going right now to me is like, First of all, your stuff looks great. Your, the team that you guys put together looks really great for the targeted audience you want. But the fact that you have this tool set that you created, you know, a lot of blogs might be interested in what you shared. And by, by sharing the tools, you are inadvertently sharing the characters, you know? So it's sort of like, it's not like really um, overt, like, you know, come check out Ray and Clovis. It's like, no, we use these tools to build our animation, you know. So, so then people were like, oh, well, let's see the result. So imagine it's like a story. Someone tells you, you know, this is how I built this. Like, okay, well, how do you start? Like, what tools did you use to build your product? And then after the end of the story, they go, well, what's the result? You know, <laughs> they, they want to know what the result. The result is uh, those, those the short films and stuff you guys have been putting together. So that's sort of connecting with bloggers and that's in that space and you guys have a really good package already going that it you know I can't see why a blogger wouldn't want had information 
to uh, share about what you guys are working yeah. on. The only thing that they need to help help with is one, they need to know who you are. So you need to take time to nurture that relationship. You know, uh, several bloggers, and then you need to like offer help in terms of maybe a guest blog, um, and then um, you know, then you can share your work. So that's sort of the general strategy. Yeah. After all this stuff happens, then you make your move. You know, like you just got to know when the, to like. Okay, this is an opportunity. Let's not blow it. You know. Right. 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 Um, so yeah. So we ask this big question of like, well, why do you do this anyway? And there's a, there's a funny like I don't I can't find the exact quote, but in marketing they kind of say these things in business too. It's like the fastest way to lead a parade is to jump in front of a parade. <laughs> Meaning like you can start from the back of the parade. And then slowly you work work your way up from like the trombone section to the jugglers to whatever it might be to before you're like with the baton leading the parade. Um, but in business, the idea is like you've got a partner, which is what you're asking. Is like, well, how do you connect with these bloggers and press people and um, you know larger influencers? Well, yeah. you, you, that's that's the goal. You're not you're not necessarily going to be a leader. Um, but you're going to be associated with what really should this this quote really should change to like the fastest way to co-lead a parade is to join the leader of the parade. You know, <laughs> that's yeah. really what should be said. But I think people get the gist of what this uh, saying is. And if you want to be discovered, again, bottom line, they first have to know about who you are. Like they they need to know who that you are that you're real. That like you're not just something out of nowhere. You come with an email mm -hmm. like, hey, um, you know, I follow what you do. I really like what you're doing. Well, let's talk about partnering up. Those, those are that's a, not a bad way, but it's you can imagine if you're on your end of things, like you're you're so busy doing what you need to do that if you get these emails that people are asking, like, hey, let's uh, I like what you do, but let's talk about partnering up and doing something this way. If if they don't really, if I don't know who this person is, um, I I need to take time to you know to know what what they're capable of, of or. Or that, vice versa, you know. Like I, I'm still a small fry. Like I'm still working my way up in with Film Trooper, and you know I'm do, I have to do the same thing. I have to provide value to the people that I like following and that I value very much. And then if there's an opportunity to share something, um, I will jump on that opportunity. Um, but I do know that that's sort of the the strategy that is taught to us by all those successful online online entrepreneurs and marketers. So that is at least the basis of the strategy. And um, let's see, I'm going to take a quick break to just see if you had any follow-up questions before I go into this <laughs> next section of, um, of, the, of the questions that you had for me. Yeah. Um, the, just thinking about all of this for a second. So, so what is your result? Like what if, if you had, if for your team, the theory, theory animation, is there one result that you guys would really like to get? Would you like to get picked up by like a, uh, like a Nickelodeon or something like that? Yeah, I, I, I like getting that question because that's um, the assumption there is that you know Nickelodeon picks you up and then uh, every, everything's great. It's all you know, it's all gravy and. But it's not because yes. they will own your show and they will have it done in India or Korea and you'll get a small paycheck one day. So that's not a solution. Um, no, there's a great studio. I'm going to give you an example. There's a great studio in Shreveport, Louisiana called Moonbot. And I, I love everything about these guys. And they employ a, a, probably almost 100 people now. Artists, animators, programmers, designers, and they make these amazing commercials. Every six to nine months, they did the Chipotle one. Uh, they did a really great one for Dolby the other um, last year uh, during the Oscar season. And they make iPad apps, really, really beautiful iPad apps. And they employ a solid amount of people in this tiny little place. You know, no one even knows where Shreveport is. It's like way north of Nolens, and I, I love it. You know, and that, right? That, that, that's what I want it to be. Um, for example, we're gonna launch like a subscription service, a, a, a little like Patreon is one example of it, but like a subscription service to the studio where you know we we deliver a new experience to you every month. And in the beginning, though, those might be short films, and then they'll become apps and whatever else we can experiment with. But you subscribe to the studio, you know, subscribe do, to the artwork that we make. Do those guys in Shreveport? Do they make like an app called Numbers? 
They do. They make numbers. Yeah. Okay. I, yeah. I bought that one uh, yeah. maybe a year and a half ago. It was beautiful. Like it was yeah. just a simple. But that that that's sort of the business model you guys want to uh, shoot for. Right. You know. Um, maybe they're apps. Maybe they're short films. Maybe they're commercial work. That would be fantastic. A self-sustained studio where we can do some really amazing and beautiful things without having to rely so much on like, well, we hope Nickelodeon picks this up yeah. or, you know, we hope we get a, a hundred million views so we can get ten dollars out of YouTube this month. No, I, I think the, the, the work that we do has real value to it and it's finding like a bridge between us and the fan base. So that's the goal. Really. Can I ask you, do you has anybody in your team um, have any contact with that company? Because I remember reading, yeah, I remember reading an art, a blog about them, and that 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 led me to buy the Numbers app. So, huh. check it out. so I was curious if anyone, if anybody in your team know those guys. Um, if not, not uh, I, know. No. I think that you know, I think that's probably the maybe the first thing to do mm. if I was in your guys' boat is to simply like let's reach out to them, let's go and. Um, um, first, like just be fans of the, what they're doing. Again, take mm -hmm. your time. You're at a party. You know, grease your wheels a little bit. Like, d just don't go coming out like guns blazing. Like, hey, we got our stuff. We'll have to talk to you about it. Like, you could ask like, hey, um, like really specific questions. Like, hey, I noticed that you know you guys do this thing here or the way yeah. you set up your art or layouts or something. I'm really curious. Do you guys use this? Because like, anytime you get a chance for them to share their process or you should be able to even look on like their about page uh, and find out who's working, and then everybody's got like a Twitter account, Facebook, Instagram account. Start building up a, a spreadsheet of like following those individual people. Yeah, um, I did this thing. It was it it was a failed attempt, but at least I attempt. I want to share all this stuff with you. So uh, my movie, The Cube, like was launched on Vimeo on Demand when Vimeo on De Demand finally released it to you know everybody else where you can sign up. Um, but my film was so small; it, it wasn't in any festivals or anything like that, and it wasn't um, was you know. I was curious at how you get like how Vimeo would be able to uh, feature it because sometimes they have like on their featured Vimeo on demand page. So they they were trying to highlight whatever uh, exclusive contracts they got with uh, certain filmmakers that had a pretty good run of um, you know their film in a film festival, so something like that. So, you know, I was contacting them because I had taken the time because Vimeo shows, like, everybody who works there. And then they have, like, a Twitter account, you know. So and so I just following people on Twitter to see what they're talking about. And I was trying to, you know, comment and, you know, just be a friendly um, you know, community member. And it got down to the par part where I actually sent them, like, um, they're in New York City. Um, I'm not sure exactly, like, the south part of Manhattan. Mm -hmm. And... I looked online, and there's this whole big thing about, like, uh, you know, uh, cupcakes. You, you know, it's like, it's a big thing. Yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. you know, I, I think I, I heard just, about this. Yeah, so, uh, um, so I grabbed, I just ordered some cupcakes, and I knew who to send it to. So I sent it to basically the, um, the acquisition service, so like their uh, programming team or something like that. Um, essentially, I, I wasted, you know, as much money as I would have wasted if I had submitted my film to a film festival and got rejected, you know? So, because <laughs> my, my think my thinking was, like, ah, what the hell, you know? Yeah, Send right. them some cupcakes, and I put it in the cupcakes. There was like a little uh, one sheet about the cube and saying, hey, you gotta try, you know? What the hell? Like, maybe you guys can feature it. So they just took the donuts and never featured it. So. <laughs> But that's to say that it was like a fail. It was a failed attempt, but at least you know it was a noble attempt to. You know, you uh, never hear about those. Yeah, you know. I can interrupt you, but like, I, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but like. Yeah, go go go. Yeah. Like, people. Okay, so I I love Reddit. Okay, and and one of the Reddits that I frequent is the Entrepreneur subreddit. Great community. Um, once in a while, a little garbage here and there. Um, uh, but overall, great community. But I I love how like hypothetical, okay, I'm making fun of it, but they'll be like, how do I make this website to sell this uh, thing that I'm importing from China that I'm going to sell for 30 cents less on Amazon or whatever? How do I how, how do I get the Chinese supplier? How do I put it on Amazon and how do I sell it really quickly? Like, how, Someone tell me how to do all these things so that I can take your knowledge and make money with it. 
<laughs> and I love those people because they have balls, but no one's going to tell them because, you know, those are trade secrets. And I'm not, I'm not saying that no one will tell them. Maybe somebody will. But, you know, it takes a lot of failures to, you know, get in contact with a decent supplier in Alibaba and get, figure out how to get, you know, Amazon and freight on delivery or freight on board and, you know, fulfilled by Amazon, how to, how to figure out all of that stuff and then how to market it and sell it and everything. And and that's all mistakes and failures, right? That's, yeah. that's how you get there. And yeah. uh, I love how people just like just why doesn't someone just tell me why why do you guys not share this information? And it, you know because that information is literal literally real time and effort and sweat and everything spent. Does that make sense? Like it's actual stuff that was spent to do. Yeah. And um, and yeah, you know that's what it takes. I think. Yeah, it's 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 interesting because it's um, yeah, you gotta try. You know, I think it's fun. This whole thing, this whole exper experiment, uh, even this film marketing Fridays. You know, I don't get a lot of views um, on uh, YouTube yet. You know, but I do think there's a lot of value here because it's just we're talking yeah. about this very important factor in the independent film sp uh, spectrum, which is the marketing side. Mm -hmm. um, you know, again, I I don't proclaim. Sorry, I bumped this mic, guys. I don't proclaim to be like any expert. I'm just an enthusiast of just like grabbing all this information. I'm curating and I'm trying to connect the dots and bring it down and saying, hey, this is what they're all saying, but this is why it makes sense. So like yeah. for me, if you, again, this is a whole thing. Like if you want to be the leader of the parade or you want to be co-leader parade and you want to be uh, where that one particular studio is, I, you guys have built enough stuff up that, you know, just take your time to get to know the people online a little bit, you know, um, yeah, I guess you're. Nah, I guess you're kind of a stalker. I mean, aren't we all on social media? Yeah. You know, when you start following somebody, you're kind of a stalker. You know, yeah. <laughs> so you got to just break that ice to be like, hey, um, you know, it's just you're just trying to get the conversation going. Like, what tool did you use? I noticed that in the app, you guys did this really cool thing, and we're trying something on our end of this, but we, we can't figure it out. Like, oh, so then it's like industry professionals meeting in industry professionals, and they might be on LinkedIn that you can connect with them. The, you know, yeah. Twitter, Facebook, anything like that. Anybody that you can just start get the conversation going. So then it's, you're you're just trying to break the ice. You're just trying to get the to see where it leads you. And then when you see that opportunity, you say, hey, you know, uh, after several weeks of doing this, it's like, is there any way that you know, are you, like so and so, are you free to do like a, a hangout session or a Skype session? I'd love to yeah. show you what we're doing, but you know, we're really we're kind of stuck on this one thing, and it's it's kind of fun because people are they feel like if you give them them enough um, kindness or sharing what they're working on or kudos or what they're doing, yeah. And you just ask for a simple favor, like, do you think you could help us just like half hour of time? You know, this is it's the virtual version of like, I will you know I will send you a cup of coffee, like you know it's one of those things like I will send you a Starbucks gift card since I'm not in the same city with you. But let's just have yeah. a Skype session where you can, you know, so you can buy your Starbucks cup of coffee, and we can just have an hour conversation. Because I, I, I'm stuck on this thing, and I was really wondering if you could possibly help me or talk about it. Yeah. And then there's this weird feeling, like, of course, yeah, you, you've been there, or like I know who you are. You're not a stranger to me, and um, I, I appreciate all the the stuff that the conversations we've had. Of course, let's get together. And then what'll happen is beyond better than anything I could do or anybody else is like they will kind of give you the you probably find out the real workings of like what they need what you probably need to do to take uh, theory animation to the next level you know yeah. and you never know where that stuff goes you, they go gosh you know what we could really use like your team to do this thing that we're expanding on you know I mean you don't know I, I, it's, it's one of those things I think that it'd be fun to find out like uh, what kind of connections you guys can make um you know, and yeah. it's, you know, and they, you're, they might be somebody you look up to, heroes, and they could totally just disappoint you and be like the biggest douchebags ever. No, I was kidding. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm just right. kidding. It's, it's uh, yeah. you never know. <laughs> yeah, 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 I hear you. But uh, anyway, let's. Um, I want I want to ask uh, answer uh, some of the other questions as we hit the hour mark here because I don't want right, to go too over too too long for everybody watching. Um, Okay, where am I? Oh, screen, this screen right here. I will share this. Okay, you see this, right? Yes. Says, what's more important? You had this uh, question too, which is, uh, oops, wrong one. Oh, wait. 
Do you not see me now? Okay, now I see. Yeah, yeah. for yeah. some reason I'm blank, but you're good. Yeah, I I hit too many buttons. Okay. <laughs> uh, so yeah, there's a here's a general question about in the world of marketing that, that I've been studying and and that I, I tend to agree with, is that there's all this whole question of like, well, what is more important? Uh, a lot of Facebook likes, a lot of Twitter followers, a lot of YouTube subscribers. Now, there could be said, you know, Facebook likes might be hitting, like they just announced. Um, I did see that. Yeah, they're, they're, anybody has like an inactive account that had, that had liked a business page um, or they can kind of verify as like I'm not a real person or something, they're going to take away those likes. So a company that might have had or a film project that might have had like, you know, 50,000 likes might suddenly go down to 500. You know, because you, the reality is, is those likes might have been, you know, bought from a click farm, anything like that. But uh, Facebook is going to try to strip that stuff out. And then Twitter followers, followers are very interesting because it's like, you know, there's certain people that are truly influential because either they're celebrities or whatnot, where they have, you know, almost, you know, over a million or several hundred thousand f uh, followers, and they only follow maybe a, a few, a handful. That, that's very rare. What you normally see is like. Somebody has forty thousand followers, and they are following forty thousand people. You know, so, yeah. <laughs> so I mean, it's just, it's kind of like the the. But the thing is, is like in Twitter, like, you know, it's so uh, fleeting, like what information gets uh, in the feed because it's so much, so many people. If you're following that many people, sometimes you have to control it by like what lists you see. You know, it's a little bit more managing uh, of the news feed or the feed that comes up, and then YouTube scribe subscribers. Then there's something to be said though for a lot of YouTube subscribers. Now YouTube just recently did the same thing that Facebook is go going to do with their Facebook mm -hmm. likes. So YouTube subscribers, um, they just a few months ago um, had eliminated a lot of these uh, channels or people that had a lot of subscribers and because uh, they were able to like to I guess decipher whether or not they were inactive accounts or clickbait or just you know useless sort of um, followers, you know subscribers. So mm -hmm. somebody who was a YouTuber making say three thousand dollars a month off like they were they had like a hundred thousand subscribers. They're like, yes, I'm making ad money off my subscribers, a hundred thousand a month. Well, yeah. YouTube comes in and cleans house and says, you know what? A lot of these are not even real, you know, subscribers or something like that. And so now these people that used to be making three thousand a month are making three hundred dollars a month from their YouTube wow. subscriptions. I didn't know about that. But... Yeah, so it, it's you know, um, so you have to have real people behind those subscribers, and and, and that's you know it was to the benefit of YouTube or Google because like wait wait if we're paying out three thousand a month, we got to make sure that there that the ads are really going to real people, real subscribers. So they had to do they had to do the back end cleaning house, and so there's a lot of um, unfortunately a lot of uh, YouTubers that were used to get making a, a little bit of money like that now they're not making as much so that always comes down to what is really more important which is all these things getting Facebook likes Twitter followers and a YouTube su subscription subscribers all of it is designed to use this as like a, a platform to advertise and promote but you gotta get everybody back onto your email list because the email list is gold, and meaning that you know we might see um, you know Twitter feeds or, or Facebook posts. We only see like what they want us to see. Like if you don't by default, like Facebook has by default, they only let you see in your news feed if you've recently added that friend or you constantly uh, like something or interact with that person or that page. But mm -hmm. like you might go, you know, I never see anything from Joe Smith that I'm friends with. It's because you're um, because you have to go into the back end settings of Facebook and change your newsfeed settings so that it's not on the default. You actually have to specifically make sure that you want to see everybody. You know, you, there's a lot of more work to it. But that, yeah. but, but 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 the thing is, it's all fleeting. All the social media stuff is fleeting because you never see everything that comes through um, the newsfeed or the posts or the updates and all that kind of stuff. But email, email is still strong because one of the first things we all do in the morning. Is open up our phone and start scrolling through and uh, you know deleting, spamming, you know, reporting a spam or whatever it might be coming in. So email is still an active. Somebody has to actively deal with an email. So if they see 
if, if you're able to get people onto your email list, then you have to make sure you're providing these people, your fans, with great value like in the email. So you, yeah. you have to learn copywriting. You have to learn how to write great headlines so that when somebody's scrolling through, it says David from Theory Animation. You know, and then what kind of great uh, headline can you put in the subject matter that, that looks like it's a friendly invite to like click? So when they click open up your email, there's a lot of, you know, they want that content as long as you can make it interesting. If it's really spammy, like we're always trying to sell something, they're just going to spam it or just or just delete it or unsubscribe from your account. So there's a whole art form, art of email marketing that we can get into later, but you were asking what's more important. Facebook, Twitter, you know, um, Google+, Plus, anything like that, any social media, you, everything's designed, it's all of this, the same strategy. It's designed to get somebody onto your email list because you don't want to build on rented land. Because mm. on the email list, you have complete control of how you are going to market and communicate with your audience uh, or your fan base. You don't have that when you're building on like Facebook likes or YouTube subscribers because you know these companies are constantly changing the rules. So, yeah. you know, so you're like, okay, wait, you know what? Number one rule, don't build on rented land. Use it to promote. There might be something new, a new social media pops up, you know, maybe Lincoln, you know, takes a surge or, you know, uh, Vine or anything like that. Either way, you're trying to get them onto uh, your email list where you have more control. So let's see here. Oh, that's me. We'll get back to that later. Anyhow, um, those are the sort of the questions that you uh, shot over to me, which are great because they're really poignant. It was like, look, I've got this thing, this amazing thing I built, and I think I hope everybody gets a chance to go over to Theory Animation to That'd check out awesome. the amazing, the amazing work that you guys are doing. Also, subscribe and get on your email list and all that kind of stuff. And then, um, and then we can follow your journey if you yeah. were able to connect with this company. Um, the Moonbot, is it? Was it Moonbot Studios? Moonbots, that's right. Yeah, and it'd be interesting to see if they're. Um, you know what comes out of that? I will, and, yeah. Yes, and then all this other stuff. We just kind of touched sort of the basic strategy, but it's important to know where to start. And I think the big one was, for me, to take the takeaway from this conversation is be really clear what your results, what kind of results you guys want, because if it was to get more subscribers to your YouTube page so that you can build up the subscription base for uh, Clovis and uh, Ray and Clovis. Then that's a whole other strategy. Then that's a whole other marketing strategy because then you're like, okay, then there's a lot of information out there of like how to build more subscribers or get more subscribers. So that way, then all your marketing message is designed to get that result. If your result, if you want the result to get more people on your email list, then then all your marketing message that you put together or a strategy you put together in terms of all the marketing materials. I'm oh, sorry, guys, I bumped my mic again. Um, will be um, will be very specific for that. And I'll show you, like, for instance, um, one, I just, I lo again, I said I'm an enthusiast about all this stuff, so I just blab a lot, and I love talking about this stuff because it's such an interesting topic and such an interesting puzzle to try to solve. Yeah, yeah. And, um, but, you know, I I'll show it here because what I do is talk about our marketing result. Um, as I go back to the screen... I'm writing some of these ideas down, so if you're typing. Yeah. <laughs> and the good news, this is always will be up on uh, filmtrooper.com as well as the YouTube channel, so you can see it all um, uh, later on. So so we the, the thing here is I'm trying to provide value to the independent film world in terms of discussion about in the, like film marketing, like this last remaining barrier of like how do we how do we solve this? And but I'm trying not to be a dummy too. Like, well, if, if people are watching this, then and they like what I'm doing, then I try to offer them a free gift. And so this is me, you know, unveiling sort of the the methods that the marketers teach us, mm -hmm. which is, you know, I give away this free gear guide um, um, over at freegearguide.com, and it's an equipment list of everything I use to make a, a um, feature film with no crew, which is the cube. And so if you're interested in seeing what equipment, everything that I use, then you can yeah. get this free gear guide in exchange for an email. So people sign up for the email. and then That's really they also, smart. So then they, what happens is they get part. Then my job is to make sure I continue to provide value to the people that sign up for the email so that um, they get more stuff about this whole topic about Film Trooper and helping filmmakers become entrepreneurs. And this is a, something I tried, which is the headline, if you look at it, 
it says, you know, stuck trying to make your film because, you know, I don't know, I, I have to play around with the different headlines, but this is intended to try to strike an emotional chord with independent filmmakers because it is frustrating because you might have this it film is. you really want to make, but sometimes you're like, ah, I'm, I'm just stuck right now. I don't have the resources or, you know, the money, you know, to make what I want to make. So the idea here is that I have to try to sell people to say, look, if you're stuck, then maybe take a look at this free gear guide because people love looking at equipment, you know, like when you go to a magazine, it's like, oh. Oh, I'm the same. Know, I love yeah, it. Yeah, it's like here's the, you know, the top 50 cameras of 2015 or whatever it might be. So it's, you know, I'm not offering like here's this free ebook that's 300 pages long where people are like, God, that's way too much. I don't know who this person. I'm not going to read that. But they'll read a quick gear guide, and so that's why I wanted to make sure I created something that was worth at least giving your email address over so that you can get it. And then if you like what you see, then you might enjoy everything else that I'm putting together at Film Trooper. So this is a marketing message. This is a method of communicating a result. My res the result I'm hoping is that people are uh, interested enough that they would be willing to um, uh, give me the, uh, give it over an email address in exchange to get this free guide and then in exchange to see what else I have to offer. So that has a specific result. So you're at this place where you're going to, you know, you and your team have got to get to that place of like what are, what's our number one result that we need to get? And yep. then everything we build around that is is our marketing message has to be directed towards be very focused at what that re result is. Is it YouTube subscribers? Is it getting to Moonbot? Is it you know getting you know whatever in investment money? Like you know all that kind of stuff. You yeah. know for me, for me this whole little thing was is real simple of just like I'm just trying to get an email address. You know that's that's the result. But I hope to offer. But you have you got to be authentic too. You got to be able to like. You know, you got to be like, okay, I am really trying to provide value. I am trying to do this, but I understand the business structure so that I can be sustainable later on. You know, because you yeah. can't, you know, not everything can be for free. Otherwise, you know, we'd all be poor. I'll be, yeah, exactly. I'll be working on a construction and be like, I can't. I don't have time to, you know, <laughs> do all that kind of stuff. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, we can you wrap it up here. You, you <laughs> my mind here. I uh, I've taken a couple. I've, when you watch this back, I'm like I'm darting my eyes as I'm writing stuff down, you know. Um, but yeah, you've given me some really good ideas here, some really good food for thought. And I, I think there's one that I, I think it, that I've never really thought of before, which is very simply, what's the goal? What's the measurable goal? And that's I like that because like when you're an artist and you're starting out this stuff, you know, like I'm just I'm gonna do everything. I'm just gonna do it. I don't need goals, you know. You, <laughs> just, you just do stuff. But it's really like I think that's the business side of it, which is have a goal so you can measure if you're getting closer or if you're not getting closer, right? Yeah. And yeah. I I'm just learning about it. Like, yeah, right. We we do need something, you know. <laughs> Well, it's funny you have you guys have such great stuff, you know, and it's um I know it's funny for uh, the artist side or the filmmaker side, like you just needing to make something, and you yeah. need to almost like separate yourself from all the business end of things. Um, but if you can you at least give yourself a fighting chance so you understand the structure of where you need to go, and then you can compartmentalize. I'm sorry, and then and then just work on the do the work, and then come back and figure out where you are in terms of the marketing plan. Um, you know, I think the hard thing too is like staying focused. Like, cause you might yeah. just be like, oh, well, what what are we spending time on? Or or are we developing out the tool set more? Or are we? No, no, we gotta get the episode. You know, and like yeah. you guys, you guys killed yourself recently, just trying to get this trailer out for the um, uh, yeah, the, the film, film festival. festival. Yeah, and um, and I, I, it's funny. You're gonna probably get a lot of information as you go down this rabbit hole, and. It's just trying to find, you're trying to get to that place um, where it's just in time learning. And I learned this from the guys over at Internet Business Mar uh, Marketing. Um, they always talk about, you're going to just hear so much stuff that sometimes you've got to stop, block it out, and go, what do I need to know just this right now to be focused? Yeah. And there's so many wonderful things I hope to do um, with Film Trooper, but the reality is it's like, I, there's only so much I can do, so I have to, like, I'm getting to this place of, like, how can I be most productive and most efficient 
um, but be very streamlined in, in what I need to you know accomplish. And it's hard because you see you you see other people popping up and like they're doing wonderful stuff. You're like, oh, that is so cool. I want to do that. Or like, I want to start a podcast. Or I want to you know I got to do more videos on YouTube. And it's one of the things you go down that rabbit hole. It's like, oh, it's just this is too much. I got I still got to make my film. Like, okay, how do I get there? And it's helpful to have a team or have those goals, like you said, in, in place because it'll help anybody stay focused. And, yeah. and then there's a lot of trust, too. It's like, you know what? I picked a strategy. I picked a goal, a result. I'm going to keep at it until I get to that place in the next few weeks or a few months and then stop and then we'll look at where we are and retool, remeasure, or, or pivot, as uh, Eric Reese talks about in The Lean Startup. Um, yeah. So this stuff happens, but sometimes you got to just pick something, be focused, go for it, and you know just keep your blinders on. Even though you might hear some like the, somebody has a great post about like the, the newest latest social media tactic, and you know you want to yeah. you want to turn and grab that uh, shiny object, but man, it gets it just split. You know you might be zigzagging so much trying to get to that straight line. Where, where I'm sorry, where you should just be doing a straight line. So. Um, we're all in. We're all doing that together. So hopefully, uh, those who are better at focusing and s staying true to their their goals and their results, um, you know, hopefully that will pay off better for everybody uh, moving forward. I know you want to. Oh, you want us to get out of here, but I really like that. I tiny antidote. I've read a lot of books on business <laughs> advertising. I have my favorites. I love David Ogilvy, and I, I like Eric Ries. And but after a while, they all say the same thing. You know, they all say the same thing. They're just rephrasing the exact same information. And um, I like that where you just, you know what, just do it. Just stick to it. Just go. You know, I like, I like, I like the, I, I like that. So. Yeah. yeah. So get, yeah, get your results. And fi determine what your result is going to be and get there. You know. Yeah. And um, and I, I, I have, I'm one to talk too. I have to do the same thing. Like I have a whole thing of like what I gotta do, and I'm still like it, it, the hardest thing is like it never feels like you can get there fast enough, you know. And yeah. it's that whole the analogy for you know like talk about Pixar animation, you know the 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 film Cars, you know the the theme of that movie was like obviously it's not the destination is the goal, it's the journey to that destination. Um, that was the theme of that film, and it's hard. It is it's the same this. Struggle of trying to enjoy the moment, knowing that you have a goal or result in mind, and it never seems like you can get there fast enough. But yeah. you, you got to sometimes just stop and enjoy what it is in the moment. It's easier said than done. Believe me, I Absolutely. every day I do the same thing. I'm like, oh my god, I just can't get there fast enough, and I don't even know where that is. So, but, but it's still like, I, but I got to stop. Like today, I'm up here in Portland, Oregon over on the other side of the world where you are. And uh, we had this, It's the weather is really creepily wonderful. Like, it's like going to be 70 degrees this weekend, and that's unusual for Portland. Hmm. So um, where everybody in the East Coast is getting hammered, um, I don't know what the deal is in Portland, this, uh, in Oregon. Anyway, I don't know why I like the tangent. But I'm saying, like, i got to stop and enjoy it because, you know, before there's no water and, Whatever. <laughs> yeah, I do it right now. I, I get outside because I have to enjoy. It. Get outside. So. Sorry, my cat decided to join the podcast. Was your kid or cat? Cat. Cat. Oh, okay. Cat's like, hey. What's, like, what's the cat's name, Ray? No. <laughs> surprisingly, Iris and Sora, because we're big fans of Kingdom Hearts. Oh. Calm down. Oh man. Hey, the this is great. I we should do this again because I yeah. answered my questions and and I like the I got I wrote I'm serious I wrote down a couple of notes I'm sorry if you hear typing throughout the whole thing oh no no yeah but well, awesome I, you, you know it was it's it's great to have you on and I'm excited because you got to come back and say well be really great to see what happened like hey so a couple of weeks went by we grew, we connected we had a great meeting with uh, Moonbots or something like that and they gave us like uh, eye opening like information or something that helped us move forward. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously, that'd be great to have you come back, so that then the audience yeah. too can be like, you know, pro progress results. And I think no, that's what, like, it worked, or 
total yes. failure. <laughs> oh my god, they were tired. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> we all quit. We all went into like developing yeah. like medical animation. You know, <laughs> medical marijuana thing. You know? <laughs> you know, it's terrible. All right, thanks. Well, over man. over here it's legal now. Like oh. I think, uh, or in. Yeah, so Washington is legal in Colorado. I think Oregon just passed it, so, you know, I don't know. My dad. No, it's kidding. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> All right. Well, hey, thank you so much, and I look yeah, forward man. to uh, seeing the latest, what happens with Theory Animation and Ray and Clovis and everything you guys are doing, and I'll make sure to post up uh, wonderful links and everything like that so people can sh uh, um know more about what you guys are doing, and I will share you the link so you can blast it out to your people. Nice. Done. Awesome. Send it over. Great. David, thank you guys so much. Again, i got to do my last bit of house cleaning here, or uh -huh. what we call my version of paying the bills. Yeah, so hey, like you saw earlier, if you're stuck trying to make your film, then head on over to freegearguide.com where you can get an equipment list of everything I made to make a feature film for $500 with no crew. Again, this is a feature film, not a short film. And uh, so if you need some inspiration to see what, what I did, then, yeah, freegearguide.com. And thanks for everyone for sticking around for another episode of Film Trooper Presents Film Marketing Fridays. Thanks a lot.